This week on Dialogue, the future of U.S. forces in Europe. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Now let's meet our guests. Lieutenant General Mark Hurtling is Commanding General of U.S. Army Europe. He assumed that post in March of 2011. Robert Litvak is Vice President for Programs at the Wilson Center, where he also serves as Director of National Security Studies. Gentlemen, welcome to Dialogue. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, John. Thank you. I want to begin with a little scene setting. Uh, let's not assume that the history is widely known. As I was preparing for the discussion, one thing I realized is that uh, troops in Europe are not the way Americans think of troops in other places. We accept troops in Europe as part of the terra firma, part of the, the national security picture. We don't talk about whether or not they should be there or how long they've been there. It's something that we almost accept. But there is a history to it. When did we first have troops on the ground permanently? Well, obviously it was during World War II. Uh, after the war, we had uh, several million troops on the ground. And as uh, developments occurred in the onset of the Cold War, uh, we were able to keep various sized forces throughout Europe. As recently, uh, John, as 1989, we had about a quarter million troops. Uh, they were kiddingly referred to as the Imperial Army of the Rhine, uh, <laughs> but we worked with our uh, Central Army Group partners in NATO uh, defending against the Warsaw Pact. Uh, over the last 15 to 20 years, uh, we have steadily reduced that force and have taken on new missions. And frankly, it's, it's a, a fascinating experience to be assigned to Europe today. Uh, I'm interested whenever I read uh, the uninformed say something like, hey, we're, why are we still over there? Why are we still fighting the Cold War? You know, bring those soldiers home. I think those are individuals who really don't understand what we do with the 51 other countries in Europe that we partner with and conduct theater, se theater security cooperation. Well, I hope after this discussion they'll know a little more about that. I hope so. We'll delve into yeah. some of those details. But it, back to the, the numbers. So non-combat post-World War II, what was the high point for the uh, number the, of troops? The high point during the Cold War was about a quarter of a million, about 250,000 soldiers. And along with that came a thousand of their family, or I'm sorry, a, a million of their family members, wives, children. And in fact, there was uh, several sequences of how to get people out in case the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact crossed the border. Uh, we would practice that religiously when I was a young lieutenant uh, in my first assignment over there. Uh, but then again, in, in the early 90s, after the, the, the wall came down and the borders opened, uh, we gradually started reducing the, the forces over and, there. And about 80% reduction since the 1980s. That about right? that, right. We, we currently have about 42,000 soldiers and close to 100,000 family members over there. Rob, could I get you to, to comment generally on the national security picture and how Americans think about forces in Europe? It, is it, as I suggested in my opening question to General Hurtling, something that is just part of the scene that we don't really question in any significant way? Well, for the latter half of the last century, uh, international relations were defined by the Cold War divide between East and West. And uh, the U.S. military presence in, in Europe was essential to the maintenance of peace. Mm -hmm. um, with the end of the Cold War, that um, role has morphed into a new role. I don't think anyone takes stability in Europe where two world wars were fought for granted, and they shouldn't. But the U.S. military presence has also been linked to the integration of new countries into NATO, into the European Union. So there's an important sort of socialization function uh, for um, European counterparts to interact with uh, individuals such as General Hurtling, where there is a tradition in this country of civil military relations. And having those, to those types of norms inculcated in a new Europe I think has served an important function, and it's a hedge against uncertainty in the future um, uh, and not to take the stability of, of Europe for granted. But I think there's another question, and it's where we're at right now, and it's, 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 there's this phrase, you know, out of area or out of business. And Europe has been used um, as a critical kind of staging area for operations outside of Europe. Now, politically, that's been contentious with some of the European allies. Um, uh, and I think that's really kind of the role that, uh, in terms of U.S. strategy, 
that the civilian, the National Command Authority, the civilian leadership with the military is sort of working through right now, particularly given the last decade in which we fought two, two wars um, uh, in, the, in the Gulf and, and uh, Central Asia? Uh, that post-Cold War era or the Cold War itself, certainly the three of us are old enough to have lived through that era. How do you think about the new environment for yourself as a, someone yeah. who grew up in the Cold War? How do you yeah, frame it for yourself? It literally is fascinating. Uh, what, what Rob said a minute ago about uh, the assurance piece, because uh, with the 51 countries that are in the theater, uh, we, we work with about 45 of them. But each one of them approaches things very differently. Uh, there are some countries who uh, see the American presence there as well it's always been that way and we accept them and they do provide a stabilizing force. There are others, uh, the, the more recent emerging democracies who have transformed their governmental systems and in many cases their militaries who see our presence there as an assurance as a helper, as uh, uh, an assistance in building their militaries, as helping them transform, as Rob said, into the proper democratic civilian military relationships. You know, we not only do exercises and training events and teaching sergeants and privates uh, how to fall into the right kinds of systems so alliances can, can work together, something that historically in any war has been difficult to do, but I also have the responsibility of key leader engagements with many of my partner land force commanders. And frankly, it's, it's fascinating mm -hmm. for them asking me questions of, so how do we drive a national security policy? How do we get our government officials to do this? How do we help our military buy this? You know, the same kind of things we do on a daily basis because it's democracy coaching. It is. It's exactly democracy coaching. It's the kind of things our young soldiers are doing in Iraq and Afghanistan with key leader engagements. We're doing it at a higher level. The, the, uh, talk about how the mission has changed over time. I mean, you've just been started yeah. to do that, but in many ways, where initially you were there to fight a war right. or to defend against the potential for war, right. but now the mission is expanding in significant ways. It has, and, and I, I would tell you, uh, my mission consists of several things. First of all, I have to train our forces that are there, uh, the 42,000, to conduct not only the current uh, operations, counterinsurgency in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also full-spectrum operations uh, against hybrid threats. Uh, on any given day, we have about 20, take, pick the day, between 20 and 40 percent of our forces in Europe deployed forward to either Iraq, Afghanistan, or other places. So there are out-of-theater operations that we're conducting with our allies. My second primary mission, though, is to help build partner capacity, uh, theater security cooperation, taking uh, some of our nations and saying, here's how we can work better together on the battlefield, taking others of our nations and saying, here's how you build a professional military. Talk about the uh, the threats, uh, characterize the threats, and is there some hierarchy in the way that you look at them? Uh, yeah. I know that I read a quote from you uh, characterizing Europe as, I believe, a hallway or a gateway for terrorists to uh, more friendly nations. Right. Uh, Recently, we did an analysis uh, with many of our agencies from here in the United States, the three-letter agencies, as we call them, and they came over and, and uh, presented us with their analysis of the European footprint. And one young lady from, uh, from one of the agencies suggested that if you consider al-Qaeda and extremist terrorism as the base, al-Qaeda the base, they actually are looking for places to locate as the ebb and flow of their operations go. Uh, what she suggested, and she had some pretty good rationale for it, which I bought into, is if you look at places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Arabia Egypt, as being various rooms of a house, then Europe provides the hallway uh, to get to different places. That's one of our threats. Another emerging threat and is becoming significant is the transfer of uh, illegal narcotics, the transnational narco-terrorism, if you will. What we're seeing is not only transfers of drugs, human trafficking, weapons, uh, criminal activities from east to west, we're also seeing in some cases, and the DEA will point this out, the transfer of drugs from uh, South America into Portugal, Spain, and into the Iberian Peninsula, and then up through Europe. So there are several threats across the continent that I think many of our partners, our alliances, are dealing with. There's also the case of increased population that consists of potential extremist uh, Islamists. So all of those things add to somewhat of a, of a churning and a transforming of the European footprint.
And how, and how do you actually respond to those threats? In other words, uh, some of this sounds like it's police yeah. activity, not the job for uh, the armed forces. It is, but what I would suggest is we have the capability to pass information to other armies and other governments. We certainly don't conduct kinetic operations within the European footprint itself. But we have military intelligence assets, targeting assets, uh, signals assets that will contribute to other nations uh, catching the kind of uh, malign actors that transit the regions. Does this change the type of soldier that you need? Uh, it, it, it does. It, it, makes, it makes our youngest of soldiers, uh, we require them to be much more educated, much more professionally savvy, much more tactically alert than they've ever been before. That's a training issue. Uh, when you're talking about uh, reacting to hybrid threats, or asymmetric warfare, and especially war among the people where other soldiers aren't wearing uniforms like we've seen in, in recent conflicts, it, it takes a, a very quality young man or woman to, to conduct those kind of operations. A lot of training involved there. Rob, I, wanna, I don't want to dominate all the questions. No, no, I, just, I, I have I, many more. Um, you know, uh, General Hurtling's you know, comments about the character of the threat resonates with kind of work we've done at the Wilson Center, which mm -hmm. is try to elucidate the nature of the, the emerging international system where you see changes taking place at all levels, transnationally, interstate, and intrastate. And, uh, uh, the, and yet we live in an international system where states remain the principal units. Mm -hmm. And you're operating in the European context with, your, with allies, uh, working with national militaries and uh, uh, their interaction with, with their, their uh, uh, ruling uh, um, governments. Um, I think um, as one tries to get a handle on threats that are of a transnational qualities, one keeps coming back to the importance of developing effective state-based strategies. Absolutely. That if you can get it right on the state level, um, and it's hard, particularly in areas where there are state, you know, uh, zones without uh, authority, you know, like a Yemen or Somalia, um, or we have weak governments or, or st governments that are turning a blind eye to bad activities going on in their territory, it's tough. But I think in terms of U.S. strategy, um, getting it right on the state level doesn't eliminate the non-state problem, but really takes you quite a ways there to doing so. Um, and I think one's seen that in the, in the area of terrorism mm -hmm. and, and getting um, a, a form of uh, deterrence by denial, as they've referred to it in, in, in strategy, of just, yeah. just making the operating environment that much tougher and, and the importance of states in doing that. Yeah, and one of the things, and Rob brings up a very good point, because one of yeah. the threats I failed to mention with, uh, that we're partnering with a specific state uh, is the emerging role of cyber activities mm -hmm. as, as a omnipresent threat. Mm -hmm. and, and recently, uh, we've started to conduct some information exchanges where we're learning as much as we're teaching with the, the nation of Estonia, or as they like to call themselves, Estonia, because they are going more into the electronic uh, mm -hmm. capabilities of, of state yeah. defenses. So we're learning things from our European partners as much as they're learning from theirs in those kind of activities. Uh, there was one other thread of your comment that I wanted to pick up, uh, General Hurling, and that is that um, as we're moving forward, as a country, we're really at a, a, a kind of taking the last decade into account the two wars, what's going on with our national economy. We're at a point now where we're, where U.S. grand strategy um, is uh, being debated in new ways. What is the American role in the world? Mm -hmm. And will we continue to do it you know, in the same way? American grand strategy has been, uh, an official once characterized it as integration. We want to integrate new um, you know, zones into, uh, uh, like the former uh, communist bloc, into an international system. But the United States is going to be constrained. This is sort of at the most macro level. And I wanted to get your take in terms of how it affects the Army, because there are kind of two versions of what's going on, you know, as a layperson looking at the debate. One version is, and one saw this a couple years ago, that the Army's moving into sort of counterinsurgency, and that's going to become the new thing. And the other is, you know, what Secretary Gates said at West Point, you know, like, uh, uh, the, you know, quoting, I guess, MacArthur, that anyone would have to have their head examined to want to do another one of these, given the experience we had. So I think that sort of, where does that leave the Army in terms of being caught at the switches? And, you, and, and just one other element to it, the person or the individual who in the public mind is most associated with sort of the counterinsurgency strand has now gone to take over, you know, authority at the CIA, leading kind of the drone wars and, and sort of 
what's what's been more uh, publicly prominent in the last couple of years. There are no, I mean, it's sort of just those are the outlines of a dilemma. But I just wanted to get your take on. Yeah, on I, I think they're all very good questions that are being debated yeah. in several uh, yeah. places. But I think when you look at it from a soldier's perspective. Uh, many of us realize that counterinsurgency, while a critical mission over the last 10 years, is just a subset of mm -hmm. something we might be asked to do. Uh, even as we uh, see some of the conflicts drawing down, uh, certainly in Iraq, soon to be in Afghanistan, we're going to be faced with other challenges, with other conflicts. We don't know what they're going to look like. Certainly there is some talk about directing our attention to Asia Pacific and, and uh, mm -hmm. the Middle East, and those are all well and good. But what we've seen in past, in our history, we've seen every time we've directed in one place, we've always gotten it wrong. Mm -hmm. So to, mm -hmm. to go back to your question, I think uh, the demands on the military, and especially the demands on soldiers, because that's who I train, is to become as adaptable mm -hmm. and as versatile as we can be. Adaptable, being able to see what kind of threats are out there and then quickly being able to address them, mm -hmm. and versatile, versatile being able to go from one to another if we asked to do that by the American people. Uh, looming over our discussion, uh, sort of over our world, uh, budget cuts and the financial circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, the military is going to uh, pony up with its share of the cutting. Uh, what does that mean for troops in Europe? Is there an optimal number that you can get to that involves some cutting but doesn't get us into dangerous territory? Well, there, there are certainly uh, there are some things I've already offered uh, as part of this. Um, Ahead of the game. Ahead of the game. No. And those are being considered. But as, as many have already said, to include uh, Admiral Mullen before he, he left the, uh, uh, the chairman's job, everything is on the table. Mm -hmm. So for me to comment on that would be premature because I know there's a lot of people in this city who are talking about how do we balance between the budget uh, deficits, the constraints we have in terms of what we can and cannot spend versus diplomatic power, and military power. You know, to make a great nation, you need a balance between the three as best you can. Uh, what concerns me right now is it seems a lot of people are shifting their attention on only the economic power, uh, and we have to have the bright mind saying, hey, there's a diplomatic and military piece of this as well. Why do you think that is? Is that just a complacency that's built up over time, or is it some sense that the threats we'll be facing don't lend themselves to ground troops? Um, I think both. Uh, I think there are there is certainly an element of our of our uh, key thinkers who believe that you know we can do things with uh, high powered machinery, precision weapons, uh, and we don't really need ground troops anymore. We've already fought our ground battle. But I would remind folks, as I, as I think Secretary Panetta did the other day, we said the same thing uh, about September 10th of 2001. Uh, so so we have the same kind of arguments coming back to the fray. And one of the lessons I believe we've learned from the last 10 years of conflict is uh, the integration of the various services, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, the Coast Guard, the agencies uh, in, in conflict resolution and attempting to address the challenges our nation faces. You, we've mentioned training a couple times, but specifically I want to ask you about the advantages of training with the allies side yeah. by side. It, it's great. Uh, it, it's great, I think, not only for them, and they will admit that, but it's great for us uh, because it, it literally is a professional uh, expansion of our cultural uh, awareness, number one. Secondly, uh, anytime you can train with an element before you get on the battlefield, it's a good thing. And we've never done that well in past conflicts. Uh, I remember in the early stages of this war, the first time I deployed, uh, we had coalition forces on the battlefield that frankly could not fight. Uh, they were part of some of our alliances. They were certainly part of the Coalition of the Willing, but there were national caveats and just plain training deficiencies that were not addressed before they deployed to the fight. Mm -hmm. Today, I would suggest you talk to the commanders on the ground in Afghanistan, and there are very few of our allied partners who are not willing to take up their load. And in fact, what I see in Europe in the nations I deal with, the land force commanders I deal with, they take a great deal of pride in fighting shoulder to shoulder with us. Uh, there are some specific ones that I would address, the Poles for one, uh, the Italians, uh, the Germans, the French, some that would say, wow, they're fighting alongside of us in, in Afghanistan? They are, they make up a third of the force. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, the, the statistic I like to cite is 85% of ISAF in Afghanistan come from the European footprint. 
So 85% of the fighters uh, as part of the, the ISAF force in Afghanistan are from my battlefield and we've trained with them and exercised with them and helped prepare them for the fight and their armies are happy about that. When you talk about this kind of coordination, uh, describe the command structure. How does that work? Uh, well, in the exercises, in the training, or in the conflict? In, in both. In, well, in both the preparation and then the actual mission. Yeah, in exercises and in, in the training, uh, it is a coordinated event. Right now, today, we have one of our brigades, the 173rd Airborne Brigade, training at our training center in Grafenbeer and Hornfels. With them, underneath them, they have a Polish airborne company. They jumped in, they started their fight. It's an asymmetric fight, not a coin environment, uh, trying to view toward the future in the post-ISAF realm. We have Slovakians and Slovenians providing the opposing force to them. So they literally see another force in another uniform plus civilians uh, who don't speak their language that they have to fight and train against. Uh, there are 13 other allied nations providing observer controllers to that battlefield. So that was a coordinated event that we planned and executed and those are the kind of things we do daily. In fact, last year we did a total of 8,000 security events with partners, anything from the individual sergeant training with a sergeant from another country all the way up to a three-star headquarters training with someone else. And the, I'm sorry, Rob, go ahead. I wanted to switch to a different topic. Oh, right. uh, um, a, one of your prior, previous commands was in Iraq, and, and uh, um, I was reading uh, the uh, excellent new book by Tom Shanker and mm -hmm. Eric Schmidt, you know, Counter-Strike that, that, that relates an episode involving you in, in northern Iraq and how um, you'd, you'd basically argue that, that sort of the, the term hearts and minds was not a good way for us to be thinking about how to relate to the people right. there and you use trust and confidence. It said, could you just talk a little bit about your experience in Iraq and what that says about how Americans can interact with nationals in, in a kind of remote theater, particularly one where the culture is so different. And as we're preparing to leave Iraq, I mean, uh, um, you know, uh, what's your assessment of, you know, are they going to, their ability to make it without an, um, kind of the American I'd also be president. interested in, in the, yeah. the construct that Rob yeah. brought up, why you think uh, the uh, trust and confidence is yeah. superior to hearts and minds. Well, I think it's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to talk about it because it's, it's been sort of a mantra of mine uh, that trust and confidence is much more important when you're dealing with another mm -hmm. culture. Uh, we shouldn't be asking them to be like us. We shouldn't be asking them to come over to our way of thinking uh, or have our sorts of emotions. We should understand the other cultures we're dealing with and tell them, hey, we're fighting for the same thing that you are, uh, the dignity of mankind and womankind in your environment, so join us. And we had some significant success, I think, with that. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a different approach. You're not trying to make them be like Mike, as the commercial said. What you're trying to do is say, hey, we're brothers in this, we're sisters in this, and, mm -hmm. and we're trying to come uh, to defeat this threat to your security together, uh, and then we'll get out of here. Because I think nation building has had this connotation of trying to almost westernize or Americanize yeah. other countries, and it's sort of a, it's sort of a, such a problematic rubric, and in, in any building case. Building in whose image? Yeah. It, it, uh, it, and that's exactly right, and I think that's the mistake we made in the first several years in Iraq mm -hmm. and, in, and in Afghanistan, because we were trying to judge them according to Western standards, mm. and they're not a Western nation. So both in our fighting and in our interaction with the people, uh, we were asking them to understand us on their land mm -hmm. when in fact we needed to understand them and work together toward advancement. And I think when we got to that point, when we understood as military <coughs> leaders after several years of the fight, uh, and this was normally born on the mm -hmm. back of the youngest of our warriors, the captains, the lieutenants, the sergeants, the privates, uh, things started turning around. It mm -hmm. took a while to learn that, though. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the disconnect that some speak of between the, uh, the small amount of Americans who are active military in a volunteer force versus the rest who continue to shop or things like that, at least when the economy was better during wartime. Is this something you think about? Is this a concern of yours, this uh, potential disconnect? Yeah. You, and you hear, you hear it manifest in, we support the troops and the military, but we don't support the mission. Yeah. There, there, it, it is uh, um, an increasing divide, I think. Whenever you have a nation with a professional military, uh, when there isn't a feeling that you have to have some type of universal service, whether it's in the military or in teaching or any kind of public contribution to the society, I think you'll have that kind of act. 
Uh, I'm a firm believer in public contribution to the society in many ways, the military just being one of them, which I happen to enjoy because I enjoy the camaraderie of the, of the profession. Um, but I, I think it is a divide that we have to be very careful of. I know you're not in the policy business, but it sounds like you're about to endorse national service of some kind. Uh, I, I would do that. I mean, as a, as a private citizen, I would right. publicly say that I'm for national service in many forms. Yeah. Uh, uh, final thought on the uh, sort of the vision statement. Uh, we know that budget cuts are coming. We know that so the situation in Afghanistan is winding down, or at least we all hope it is. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that say? What's your vision for the future of U.S. troops in Europe with yeah. all these changes that are, are no, converging? That's, that's a great question because we just recently had something we call the Conference of European Armies, where 38 of our partners came together, our land force commanders came together. Some of them couldn't make it. Uh, and we talked for three days about the post-ISAF environment. We have gained so much over the last 10 years of combat where we have been training mm -hmm. towards something. Uh, it's like training for a race. You're motivated if you have to, if you know at the end of this month you're going to do a 10K, you know you have to get up every day to run. Um, it, when you have that kind of motivation uh, uh, in your future and knowing you're going to combat with each other, you train. What we decided as a, as a mm -hmm. conference was, hey, we've got that same kind of requirement in the future in the post-ISAF world for different threats. So we have to use the same kind of momentum to continue to train together. And we're looking to do that more as a regional approach uh, with regional actors, with groups of countries working multilateral training and exercises versus the individual unilateral things that we've been doing for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Well, General Hurling, thank you for joining us today. And thank you very much. Thanks continued for success. Me. Thank you. Rob, thank you as well. We'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Milevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.